Interested in being a nurse and working from a safer environment? Join Quantum Health at our nursing hiring event Thursday, September 16th from 8.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. or from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. to learn how. During our event at our headquarters in Dublin, Ohio, you'll meet with hiring managers for on-the-spot interviews. We offer a great work-life balance and a $2,500 sign-on bonus. Learn more at quantumhiringevent.com. That's quantumhiringevent.com. We are an equal opportunity employer. This Labor Day, put an end to junk sleep. Right now at Mattress Firm, save up to $500 on our top-rated brands when you get a king bed for the price of a queen or a queen for a twin. Plus, get a free adjustable base when you spend $6.99 on Sealy or save up to 50% on hot buys from top brands like Sleepy's or Serta. With our highly trained sleep experts and our low price guarantee, you can rest assured you'll get the best bed at the best price. Unjunk your sleep only at Mattress Firm. Offer valid with qualifying purchase. Restrictions apply. Valid at participating locations only. For offer details, visit mattressfirm.com slash sale. The following is a Hoop Bowl presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. The closing stretch of the Bespers Buckets. We are really getting up on it now. Hello. Hello. September the 7th. It's Tuesday. Feels like Monday is Tuesday. Kind of the start of the real week. Hope you guys enjoyed the uh, special Labor Day show yesterday, which is sort of like a, not a real mailbag show. It was sort of like a, uh, hey, this uh, question came up and then it, I liked it so much that I turned it into a podcast. This one will be a little bit more traditional, kind of the beginning of our regular old fashioned week. I believe this is off season episode number 82. If I've uh, continued to count that properly and maybe I'll do the the Count Along, like Sesame Street with us here on the show. I'm Dan Bespris. Welcome to the pod. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation. Hoop-ball.com, the website. Not the word hyphen, just the little dash mark on your keyboard up there, just to the right of the uh, the zero. At Hoop Ball Fantasy on Twitter, I am at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, or just Google search Dan from Hoop Ball, and I will pop up. My Twitter handle, I think, is usually like the second or third Result, although I, admittedly, I haven't actually done this in a while. Let's let's uh, let's do it while I'm talking to you guys. Dan from Hoop Ball in Google, and hey, it's number one now. All right. <laughs> oh man, there's some other silly things on there. If you scroll far enough, you got some various pictures that I've posted. How vain! How vain! What a thing! What a thing to do live on a podcast. Anyway, it's a really easy way to follow me, uh, to find me, and then follow me. And I hope you guys will. As we hit this part of the season where I know many of you are coming back out of the woodwork, and I am very appreciative that you have done so, thank you for listening to the pod. If you've been listening to the shows, you know that we left off about 85 players in in our Bespris bucket, Bespris Bucketology sequence here on the, the show. It's lasted about a week and a half now, which I think was more than I intended to, but we've sort of done a breakdown on almost every player on the board to this point. And every time I feel like I have a faster way to dive into it, I flail about and then come right back to what I'm comfortable with. What we got into on Friday, and what starts to make things a a tiny bit more complicated for our our handicapping purposes, at least for our our bucketing purposes, is that we're now kind of into no man's land. And the reason that, and, and those of you that have listened to the show for a long time, you're probably thinking, Dan, you usually say no man's land starts at about pick 70 in a draft. And yes, that's true, but... For our purposes, it's a little bit different because pick 70 in a normal draft is going to be actually probably earlier on our list because in those first 70 picks made, uh, many of the players are are guys we either have later on our board or not on our board at all. So our the guy who goes 70th, and we'll get that ADP data at some point, is probably someone we're going to have ranked, I, I would think, later. Well, not. I guess it depends which guy goes. There's, there's no obvious. It's not a one to one comparison. Suffice it to say that we should hopefully have somebody ranked higher on our own board than the guys that are going in drafts when you get to that marker. The reason this makes sense is because, again, on your way to 70, not everybody that we have in our top 70 is going to be the guys getting drafted from elsewhere. It's going to be dudes that we have outside of our top 70. So I, I think you guys follow the math on that perspective 
then looking back at what we talked about on Friday, we're at pick 85 now, basically, on our board. Not pick 85, number 85, on our pride board that we've been working through here in the Bespers Bucket series of podcasts, which means that this is probably, we're probably into guys, I hope, generally, that are going 15, 20, 25, 30, whatever slots after this on draft day. Which very much means that we are into, we're, we're past where no man's land would start in a real draft, but we're now getting into where buckets no longer make sense as your weapon of choice. And we, I think we've passed that point. I was looking back at the rank lists or the bucket lists that we'd been putting together on this show, particularly the Friday episode, and the last 10 names we did were Marcus Smart, Ben Simmons, this is not in any particular order, Bogdan Bogdanovich, Jakob Pertl, Slow Mo, Kelly Olynyk, John Morant, Cade Cunningham, Chuma Okiki, and then Larry Nance Jr., who we did bump down the board a little bit, so he's actually probably shouldn't have been included him in that analysis. There are differences among those guys, but because, and again, this is, that would be about number 75 on our board. Not pick 75, but around number 75 on our board. Probably, guys, we're at pick 90 to 100 range in a real fantasy draft. Meaning, at this point, whatever it is, if you have like pick 96, end of the eighth round you probably aren't working from buckets anymore because these guys are not going in any predictable order anymore. This is a part of a fantasy draft where players are being, quite literally, snatched out of the cloud. The cloud. Just just yanked from anywhere on the draft board. This is where X ranks or pre ranks. This, by the way, this was a point of confusion. One of my listeners was pointing out that that X ranks do a lot of the the dirty work for Yahoo. I actually agree with that. You're right. Yahoo changes the damn name of what they call it every year. Sometimes for a while it was O rank, and then it was pre rank, and then it was X, or and then it was X rank. I tend to call them pre ranks just so that I don't have to follow the goofball nomenclature that these big box sites use and change on a year to year basis. The pre ranks tend to basically be the first ADP data. They're pretty much the same thing. And then you see ADP get shifted over time by what people are doing with their own lists and by what analysts put out there. So um, this, wasn't, this wasn't a question for the mailbag. This was just uh, one, of, uh, one of our followers on Twitter that mentioned that uh, he feels that X-Rank is the thing that plays the, the major role uh, in where players go. And you're right. You're right. It's just that Right here at the very beginning, I wait for that first piece of ADP data because it gives me this indicator of where the X ranks are being ignored right out of the chute. Um, we got a report, by the way, a news report on TJ Warren. I don't, uh, I don't want you guys to let me forget to mention on today's podcast that like you guys <laughs> you yell at me in the middle of the show. Um... Anyway, looping back around to what we were talking about here, by the time you get to a Kelly Olynyk, a place where Kelly Olynyk might go in your draft, he might go, like, for instance, his X rank or pre-rank, we're going to call him pre-ranks because, again, I think that's easier. His pre-rank might be 110 or 90 or 85 or 180. We don't know, but we're past the point where we have to try to guess where he's going to be. Once you get to no man's land on draft day, and I'm realizing that today's show may actually become at least half about understanding why no man's land is relevant and important and then how that translates to our actual numbers here. So what I'd like to do then with that in mind, I think I want to do the no man's land discussion here before we go back into the actual rank list. And I know we've been sort of banging around on fantasy topics these first six or seven minutes. I I haven't even done any promo stuff on the show yet. Sheesh! I must have lost my mind, other than, you know, just saying hello to you guys. But the, re- the reason that No Man's Land is so very important and why it doesn't really work with the buckets is because I, I want to try to pare this ba- down to its most basic element. The buckets work because it gives you 
chunks of players and where they're likely to go. It maximizes your opportunity to get the most number, the the largest number of guys that you're targeting. This first iteration of the buckets that we've been doing live on air on the podcast is fairly well reflective of our actual pride rank sheet with what I believe to be fairly reasonable markers between groups of like-ranked players. Because these groups of like-ranked players are often going to be drafted near one another in your actual fantasy draft, then we take pre-ranked data or ADP data, whatever you want to call it here at the front end, and we move guys from bucket to bucket so as to improve our game theory, our draft order strategy. How do I get more of the guys I want the most? That tends to be guys being moved down a bucket or two, almost artificially, if their pre-rank is super-duper low. What that basically is doing is it's giving you a mental... You're visualizing where you can actually draft these particular players. That works for a while. After you get to a certain point, it really becomes a bit more binary on these players. Where, look, we all would love to have Drew Holiday on our team. The question on a guy like Drew Holiday is, where do you draft him? It's very much not binary. It's very much a spectrum of where you could draft a particular player. Once you get down into no man's land, it really becomes more of, hey, do you want this guy on your team or not? If the answer is yes, they go into the yes bucket. And if the answer is no, they go into the no bucket. The first question we need to answer on these guys, and and no man's land in particular, is why is this part of the draft so different than the earlier parts. The reason it's different is because the pre-rank and ADP data out at this range is worthless. It's worthless. If you find someone with a uh, with an average ADP of like 107, in all likelihood, that player really isn't going at 107. They have almost an equal likelihood of going at like 82 as they do at 132. It's really about your league's preference. And that's not a perfect example because the window is probably a little bit narrower if we're really talking about someone like right around 100. But as we've seen before, based on pre-ranks and ADP data, once you get to about player... And this year, it was this most recent season, it was even worse because COVID was such a... Uh, and short off season and bubble playoffs and all this stuff. There were all these weird factors that gunked up the machine in general the pre-ranks will keep people on point for a while and then they just start to miss all over the board which to me says at a certain point you just go get your guy you get the guy you want because the board they're putting in front of you is nonsense but that didn't really answer the question of why is this part of the draft from a rank perspective, different than the rest. The answer to all these questions, as we do with the stuff on this show, is more complicated than you can really summarize in one or two sentences. But the, I believe, the simple way to try to to position this in your brain is that at a certain point, you get into players that may or may not be drafted at all. And at that point, You really just have to take your list of yeses, the binary ones we just put on this board, and decide what order they should be on your team. It's the spectrum versus binary comparison again. When you're at X rank player 55, or even your own personal probably 55th rank player, and look, I get it. This is not 
This is not ubiquitous because I might have someone ranked in the 60s on my board that ends up with an X rank of like 120. That's the exception to the rule. Generally, the guys I have ranked in my top 60 are going to pretty closely parallel the guys that are an ADP in the top 70 or so. It's not going to be exact, but it's going to be close, which is why those guys are on a spectrum. They're going to get drafted in every single fantasy league. And then the question again just becomes where. That's why the buckets are so relevant. If you know where, in general, someone is going, you can figure out how to get them on your team in the most efficient way possible. Once you get past a certain number, you no longer know where, generally, someone is being drafted. So at that point, it really does just become not so much how to get the greatest number of your favorite players on your team, because there's just no way to know if someone's going to get back to you. At that point, no man's land, it's about getting your favorites of the remaining guys. I think that did a better job of answering the question of why the beginning of a draft is different than the end of a draft. We might not necessarily be at that exact point yet, but I feel like when you get to a name like Slow Mo or a name like Jakob Pertl or Chuma Okiki uh, or some of the other guys we've got coming up in this range like Evan Fournier, Norman Powell, TJ McConnell, these are guys that just might not get drafted in a league. I know it seems insane, but Fournier... He could just go, okay, if, you're, if your league goes 180 picks deep, he'll get drafted. But if your league is like 120, 144-ish picks deep, something like that, he might not. There just might be a league where he doesn't get drafted. All of that, and I don't mean to pick on Evan Fournier, that's not the point. The point is, we're now at a, a, a juncture, a fork in our draft strategy, where taking all of these remaining names, and when left, everyone left in the NBA, and we have to just line them up. This is the guy. These are the guys we want. And you got to make a pretty good list because, you know, we're talking like 7th, 8th round and your draft might go 14, 15 rounds. There's half your draft left. So you better get a list of like 50 to... Hopefully that would be enough. I'm hoping that 25 to 35 guys come off the board that you just didn't have on your list. But it might not be so simple. You basically need like 60 guys... And you need to arrange them in the exact order that you want them on your fantasy team. Because there is, and we've seen it all, we've all been in enough leagues to know that you might think Mo Bamba is going to get back to you a round later and he goes 20 slots before you expect. And then the guy that you had planned to draft before him You take the guy who generally goes earlier, who in our example is probably someone like like Chumo Kiki, probably goes earlier. And then suddenly he's like still on the board, 20 picks later than you expected. So there's no no rhyme or reason to this part of the draft. So at that point, if you think Chuma's going to be better than Fournier, you draft him. If you think Fournier is going to be better, you draft him. And you don't worry about what guy gets back to you in the ninth or 10th round. You cannot function like that. No Man's Land is different. The buckets are useful for draft order, rank and order. It's a combination effect of the buckets. Once order doesn't matter anymore, the buckets aren't useful anymore. Who cares that I put uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich in bucket 17 and Jakob Pertl in bucket 18? What really matters is, which of those two guys would I want on my fantasy team if I had picked number 80? So, with your blessing, everyone, I'd like to basically erase some of the last few things we did on Friday's show, and instead, we're going to turn everything from bucket 18, because I actually do believe that Marcus Smart and Ben Simmons and even Bogdan Bogdanovich are probably just a little bit better than No Man's Land guys. We're going to take everyone from bucket 18 on, and they are now going to be arranged in actual numerical order. This is the who do I want the most of the remaining names. 
Um, so redoing what we talked about on Friday, that would end up being, uh, I guess, the how did Brooke Lopez get over there? I got to shift him up a little bit. Uh, from redoing what we did on Friday, that would mean Jakob Pertl, Slow Mo, Kelly Olynyk, John Morant, Cade Cunningham, Chumo, Kiki, those, Larry Nance, who again, we moved down the board. Those are the guys that are now seven names that we're pulling out of buckets and instead just arranging in whatever order we desire them back on the main list, which for whatever it's worth actually has Olinick in front of Pirtle in front of slow-mo Ja, Kem Birch, who did we forget to put him in a bucket? I think we forgot to put Kem Birch in a bucket on Friday show. Did I talk about him even? Ha! Jumped right over him. Sorry, Kem. Uh, Birch, Cunningham, Chuma. That was the order that they would have ended up. And this is where the tweaking really gets funky. Because you start to go back through this part of your board and decide, hey, is there anyone in here that I just don't really want on my fantasy team? And the answer for me was a, a very hard yes. Like, I had John Wall in this group of guys on, the, uh, on my first pass. I don't want him on my fantasy team. He gets bumped pretty far down the board now like 20 spots this is a guy that i would come back to in a pinch and only if we've run out of my other names so here are the names i will read them to you in the order that they're currently arranged and then i'll give you some reasoning on why these are guys that sort of make the yes list as opposed to uh guys that sort of made more of the no list and a lot of the names at the end of mine are guys that made the no list. And I do, I got to move a bunch of names around also. Mm. And I probably got to get LaMarcus Aldridge on the list. Haven't been able to add him since news that he is going to play and play with Brooklyn. So let's make a note to ourselves that LMA has got to find his way onto this board somewhere. All right. So here's where things left off. The next name on the board was Karis Levert, Spencer Dinwiddie, Norman Powell, Jay Sean Tate who we may need to move around a little bit with uh, some of the positional stuff in Houston. Evan Fournier, Harrison Barnes, Miles Bridges, TJ Warren, who now is going to get bumped way down the board. And I'll let you guys in on some information with that stuff in just a second. Uh, or I guess, eh, you know, let me keep, let me read the names first, then we'll come back to TJ Warren. Uh, Larry Nance, who we talked about already, Nerlens Noel, Jalen Green, TJ McConnell, Davis Bertans, Tim Hardaway Jr., Derek Rose, Colin Sexton, Duncan Robinson, Sadiq Bey, Mason Plumley, Dion. This Labor Day, put an end to junk sleep. Right now at Mattress Firm, save up to $500 on our top rated brands when you get a king bed for the price of a queen or a queen for a twin. Plus, get a free adjustable base when you spend $6.99 on Sealy. Or save up to 50% on hot buys from top brands like Sleepies or Serta. With our highly trained sleep experts and our low price guarantee, you can rest assured you'll get the best bed at the best price. Unjunk your sleep only at Mattress Firm. Offer valid with qualifying purchase. Restrictions apply. Valid at participating locations only. For offer details, visit Mattress com Andre Hunter, Nick Batum, Daniel Tice, PJ Washington, and Mo Bamba. That was about 25 names or so, 23, 24, something like that, depending on whether or not you count TJ Warren, who, by the way, getting a massive bump down the board with the news today from the Indiana Pacers that TJ Warren's stress fracture in his left foot is healing, but not at the pace previously anticipated. He remains out indefinitely, and further updates will be provided as warranted. This is actually a pretty big deal. It has ramifications for uh, Karis Levert, who we just talked about, who gets bumped up the board a little bit. Because I, I know personally I had taken shots away from Levert, from Brogdon, from Sabonis. Not really so much from Miles Turner, but you know maybe a little bit there. Uh, Warren being out helps all of those guys, and it sounds like he's not going to be ready probably by the start of the season and if he is he certainly ain't gonna be full strength and if and if he is doubly he ain't playing in every ball game so we can go back and we can make our tweaks on that one as well but let's talk about some of these names that we just mentioned first Karis Levert who uh does get a little bit of a bump now with the news on TJ Warren but remains someone that I continue to have a little bit less trust in and this last season, that bit me because the Pacers had most of the team out when Levert got back, and he was able to just kind of go nuts. Sabonis missed time in there. Brogdon missed time in there. The guys that generally were going to take shots away from Levert. 
Do I think he gets 17 and a half shots a game this season, even with TJ Warren out? No, I don't think that's the case, which is why, you know, he was number 60. He also shot his free throws better this year than he had previous seasons, and I suppose there's a possibility that that actually sticks through. And I, why don't why don't we, for argument's sake, just say that it does? Let's say it sticks. He's an 81% foul shooter now. Uh, field goal percent is always going to be a problem for him. Steals are generally pretty good. 25-5 and five feels a bit on the high side, given the team will start with presumably all the main the cast of characters besides T.J. Warren. So uh, that's why I bumped him down just a little bit on the board. I don't... I, the, the durability stuff with LeVert is sort of weird. You know, he's had these giant injuries and then the actual... the, the lesion... There hasn't been a lot of data from him on small, nagging injuries. So if he doesn't have something catastrophic, he might actually be far more durable than people realize, which would be a checkmark in his favor. I just, I don't trust the free throw number to stay higher, and perhaps he proves me wrong on that one. But that's the reason I have him where where I did, at least before this TJ Warren information comes out. I think we'll probably move him up the board a half to a full round, just understanding that this is probably the return of two to two and a half shots per ball game or something of that nature. Similarly, Spencer Dinwiddie is a guy who's had some problems with his fantasy game in the past. His field goal percent is extraordinarily low. His free throw percent has always been weirdly low for a guy who gets to the line as often as he did when, well, at least when it was needed, in in Brooklyn like he shot 78 percent which isn't terrible but he's taking seven free throws a game not this recent season but the previous one when he was healthy yes 20 points seven assists that's all great not good defensive numbers bad percentages high turnovers he's a guy that has always needed ridiculous usage to overwhelm the bad stuff well the bad news is the field goal percent is probably going to be an even larger negative drain on your team. The good news is that he's now number two on the Wizards to Bradley Beal, and there really isn't anybody else coming for any of that usage. So we could see Dinwiddie take 17, 18 shots a ball game this year, and if his free throw percent even creeps up a little bit, he should be able to put up some fantasy numbers, but he is sig- just completely and severely capped by those percentages. He's going to be a punt field goal guy who doesn't get defensive stats, which really limits the upside. That's why we have him in this range as well. Norman Powell, who's someone who didn't, did not shoot the ball well when he moved to Portland. I bet that number comes around now as he settles in this coming season. I like him to bounce back, and I still don't get the feeling that anyone cares about his fantasy game because he is a positive percentages guy. Scores, steals, field goal percent, free throw percent, That's three of my four most important categories in block shots. No, he doesn't assist. No, he doesn't rebound. That's annoying. You're going to have to find those elsewhere. But he was number 74 this last year. And his role is actually safer because he wasn't just on permanent fill-in duty with the Raptors where he was playing, mind you, quite well. He should settle in with Portland. His role is secure. And I don't see any reason why he shouldn't be able to get pretty damn close to what he did last year. Or maybe... If the field goal percent stays near 50 instead of we saw him drop four or five percentage points with the Blazers, he could be better than that. Jay Sean Tate at number 89. This one is one that might get bumped down the board a little bit. I know they like him, but there's a lot of young screw around happening in Houston right now. They have youth. They have this weird John Wall contract that doesn't blend in with the young guys at all. But if I'm guessing here, and there's a little bit of a guessing element with young teams in general, Tate is a guy that plays even if they're eliminated from playoff contention, which basically is going to happen the third week of the season. Tate is a guy who plays because they like him. He was in the rookie of the year running. He's part of their core. And he doesn't need colossal usage to see fantasy value. He was number 116 last year, only nine shots a game. Free throw percent is something you could actually see him improve upon. He was elite in steals towards the end of the season. That's a cool way to float your fantasy value a little bit. So I get the feeling he's still going to get his 30 minutes a game with this Rockets team, and I like him to make improvements on last year, so I'll keep him in this range as well. 
Evan Fournier in New York feels like he could mostly replicate his role from Orlando, which was one of the ultimate old man squad, guy who gets drafted 120, cruises to top 90 per game value. And then the question, of course, becomes whether or not he stays healthy. I should mention, by the way, looking back at some of these names from earlier, uh, I don't think Spencer Dinwiddie plays every ball game this year, so he's a tough sell on a in a head-to-head league. Uh, Lavert, Powell, Tate, Fournier, Fournier less so. These are guys where you're not going into the season expecting them to take ball games off. I have Harrison Barnes in this part of the list. He made some nice tweaks to his game last year that improved his efficiency. That was a big deal. That probably sticks, but we don't really even know what the hell the Kings are doing, so I can't put him much higher because the upside is capped. Uh, luckily, he has a pretty good floor. Miles Bridges at 92. This is basically a roll of the dice on whether or not his uh, confidence stays strong. I think he's going to be the starting power forward for the Charlotte Hornets this year. And he looked awesome at the end of last season, but there are some pretty big question marks there on whether or not he actually comes into this season and takes as many shots as he did when he was putting up big numbers last year. Larry Nance, we've already talked about. Nerlens Noel should see his 21-ish backup minutes to Mitchell Robinson. That puts him inside the top 100. Uh, Jalen Green, everybody seems to love Jalen Green. You guys know I'll ultimately probably just take him off of my list because rookies and so forth, and he'll go earlier than any place I'd look at him anyway, but he's in this range. TJ McConnell, I think, is a nice late-round grab with some upside, especially with this TJ Warren news, which means they'll need just a little bit more playmaking, and I know they, they don't play the same position, but everybody that goes down means a little something else. McConnell feels like the, the, a typical Rick Carlisle guy in the J.J. Barea mold. Little dude playing their brains out. He'll see some decent value. Davis Bertans at 97, a chance to bounce back in Washington without Russell Westbrook around, creating that usage vacuum. Tim Hardaway Jr. played really well for the Mavs down the stretch last year. I, the, the, things will look a little bit different, but he signed that contract to come back, so I think that they have nice plans for him. Derek Rose, who I think probably gets moved down the board a little bit once this is all said and done. Colin Sexton, who we talked about, is a very safe, kind of just inside the top 100 type of guy. Duncan Robinson got paid. His role is safe. Sadiq Bay, there's some growth there. Mason Plumley, uh, this is more of an upside shot if his minutes actually can get can stick in Charlotte. DeAndre Hunter is another one of those ones where now Atlanta's healthy. Can he personally be healthy? Nick Batum with no Kawhi Leonard. He was rolling along actually in the 60s last year before uh, Marcus Morris came back. Daniel Tice in Houston should put up some okay numbers, I would assume, playing alongside at times Christian Wood. We'll see how that all shakes out. P.J. Washington might be your bench unit guy in Charlotte. And then Mo Bamba, who... You know, there's a lot going on in Orlando, Wendell Carter Jr. and so forth, but I, I do think Bamba is good enough to deserve a look. So this is the list right now, and this is a far from done kind of first big chunk of no man. And look, like if you want to split no man's land into two groups, be my guest. But I just don't see the reason to. Take the names on your board arrange them in the order that you'd want to draft them to your basketball team. Would you rather have DeAnthony Melton or Nikhil Alexander-Walker? Believe it or not, I'd rather have Melton, even though Walker's probably stepping into a much bigger role in New Orleans this year. Would you rather have Gary Trent Jr. or Reggie Jackson? I'd probably rather go Gary Trent. So these are the guys in this group where it doesn't matter if you think Reggie Jackson might get drafted. Well, that's a bad example. Gary Trent almost definitely is going to get drafted before Reggie Jackson. But like, think about some of the names I listed earlier here in, in this sort of lightning round rapid fire portion of the pod. Colin Sexton or TJ McConnell? Which one of those guys do you think gets drafted sooner? I think everyone listening to the pod simultaneously... Interested in being a nurse and working from a safer environment? Join Quantum Health at our nursing hiring event Thursday, September 16th from 8.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. or from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. to learn how. During our event at our headquarters in Dublin, Ohio, you'll meet with hiring managers for on-the-spot interviews. We offer a great work-life balance and a $2,500 sign-on bonus. Learn more at quantumhiringevent.com. That's quantumhiringevent.com. We are an equal opportunity employer. 
This Labor Day, put an end to junk sleep. Right now at Mattress Firm, save up to $500 on our top-rated brands when you get a king bed for the price of a queen or a queen for a twin. Plus, get a free adjustable base when you spend $6.99 on Sealy, Or save up to 50% on hot buys from top brands like Sleepy's or Serta. With our highly trained sleep experts and our low price guarantee, you can rest assured you'll get the best bed at the best price. Unjunk your sleep only at Mattress Firm. Offer valid with qualifying purchase. Restrictions apply. Valid at participating locations only. For offer details, visit mattressfirm.com slash sale. Spontaneously said Colin Sexton. You know which of those guys I'd rather have on my fantasy team? TJ McConnell. You guys probably think I'm crazy. TJ McConnell was number 70 last year. Colin Sexton was 103. TJ clubbed him. This is by averages, by the way. Clubbed him by averages. And beat him even harder by totals. TJ McConnell was number 33 by totals last year. And I would bet almost all of my fantasy winnings from the last five years at Hoop Ball that Sexton gets drafted before McConnell this year. Makeup of the Pacers isn't all that different. McConnell figured out how to coexist with Karis Levert last year. He will play again. He probably won't do quite as much this coming season, but he's going to play. And listen, this is not the, the Colin Sexton clowning session, but he has giant gaping holes in his fantasy game that I don't see getting fixed over this offseason. Doesn't shoot the three ball very much. Defensive stats are fine, but not great. Doesn't actually assist all that much for a point guard, shooting guard, whatever the hell you want to call him. Hybrid, really, with Darius Garland. He's fine. Sexton was fine. You know, right around the top 100, that's pretty good. That's a useful player in most competitive 12-team leagues, but TJ was better. Why am I spending so much time on this particular comparison? Because this is no man's land. You could take Sexton. 12-team league, let's see. Let's say you had pick... Oh, what's towards the end of the eighth round? Like 93? You pick 93. Those are the next two guys. Let's just say hypothetically those are the next two guys that you want to try to get on your fantasy team. Colin Sexton and TJ McConnell. Maybe it's not the best example because you could probably go Sexton there and McConnell would probably still be around for your next pick, whatever that is, seven picks later. But this is not the part of the draft to be getting cute. Whoever the next guy is on your board, you just take him. Because one of those guys could end up being a three or four round win and the other might be a dud. And congratulations if you found a way to get both of them on your team, but you really want to just get the one that's a win. What's a better example of this? Because I know a lot of you guys are thinking, Matt, it's so easy to know which one's going to get drafted in front of the other. Uh, who do you think is going to get drafted first between Tim Hardaway Jr. and Davis Bertans? Two names that we actually said back-to-back. I don't know. Probably Tim Hardaway? Probably? I don't know for sure. All I know is that I probably want Davis. Because with THJ, we know what the absolute upside is for him. The best case scenario is he's like number 90 on a per game basis. That's the best case scenario. And it's probably not going to be that good. Probably going to be more like in the 100 to 115 range. With Davis, yeah, the bottom could fall out. Be top 180. But if he does anything like he did two seasons ago... Gets a dozen shots per ball game instead of nine and a half. There were stretches he was rolling in the top 40. So sure, maybe you want to get both of those guys on your fantasy team. And maybe you think in your draft, Tim Hardaway Jr. is going to get drafted first. So I have picked 93. I'm going to take THJ. 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. 100 gets back to you. Is Davis still there? If he is, congrats. You did it. But you know what? It's not time to screw around. Take the guy you want at 93. If the other guy's gone, you go to the next name on your list. Duncan Robinson or DeAndre Hunter or Batum or whoever, one of these guys we just mentioned a second ago. And there are other names uh, that, that go beyond that. By the way, I'm not that high on Kevin Porter Jr. I just want to throw that out there. I think Brandon Clark could actually have an interesting little bounce back year. Daniel Gafford as a short-term solution. Gary Trent is in that mix. We just talked about him a minute ago. So there are some other names 
DeAnthony Melton, who we talked about, that you can get into your hopper here. But hopefully, in a 150, 160-player draft, where however deep yours might go, something in that neck of the woods, you shouldn't have to go much beyond your own top 120. If you did, it means everybody else is operating from a similar list to you, and you're going to end up probably just dumping your last one or two picks anyway. But I hope all of this that we just talked about today is a shimmering example of why at the ends, and it's not even the end, it's really like the second half of your draft, you just go get the guy you want. You go get him. Don't screw around. If let, Let's take some weird example here. Um, I mean, honestly, uh, the best example we've talked about so far probably happened like right at the front end of this no man's land, which was someone like a Jakob Pertl or a Kelly Olynyk, who, yeah, I mean, maybe we get X-rank, pre-rank, ADP. <laughs> I said I was just going to call it pre-rank, and then I stopped. Maybe we get pre-rank data on Kelly Olynyk that says he's going in the 80s. I don't think I don't think that's going to be the case. But my guess is we get this information, and we have we have some of it now from Yahoo. They're 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 beginning to drop this stuff, and we'll we'll start to talk about that. Uh, probably middle of this week, once we finish our discussion of the buckets, because we're going to want to start putting that data together now. Let's say Kelly Olynyk has a... Uh, well, do, do we have his pre-rank information as of like a day or two ago? I don't think so. Is it out there? Yeah, okay, it actually is out there. His, his pre-rank is 124 that I'm seeing on Yahoo right now. And and maybe that gets adjusted here in the next week or two. I, I do think that they're still probably fine-tuning their own stuff. Um, but... Actually, you know what? We may even have our first chunk of ADP data out there. Luka Doncic is going third? Oh, boy. Anyway, point is, I got a Linux way in front of his current pre-rank on Yahoo which is all well and good. But again, let's say we have picked 93 and it comes up on us there, and there are like 30 guys on the pre-rank board still in front of Olenek on the table, and you might have some of those guys maybe two or three slots behind him. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, Chuma or something like that, who we were just talking about, or like Evan Fournier, Miles Bridges. Maybe those guys are still on the board and their pre-ranks are in front. In fact, let's just pull up their numbers right now, just for argument's sake. Where What's Okiki's preseason rank? No, he's lower than Olenek. Uh, who was another guy that we were just talking about here? You guys are going to hear me do this live on air, because screw it. This is, the, this is part of the fun. Uh, Norman Powell, he's got to be going in front of Kelly, doesn't he? Yeah, okay, Norman's going at 95. His, pre-rank, his preseason ranking is 95. But I actually have Olenek slightly in front of Norman Powell on my board. And this, again, this could get adjusted later on. They're pretty damn close, by the way. Just if you've been listening, you probably heard their num- their names called within like two or at least three slots of one another. But again, if you're p- sitting on pick 93, this is, this is a great example, finally. Finally, I got one with good numbers to match. Norman Powell's probably going to go sooner than Olenek. But if you think one of those guys has a chance to, to cruise two, three, four rounds above the other one, don't get cute. You might lose the guy you wanted more in those next six or seven picks. The buckets don't matter at this point. You don't know where these guys are actually going. Olenek with a pre-rank of 124, he might get drafted at 85 in your league. Powell with a pre-rank of 95, he might get drafted at 85. Neither, oh, one of those guys, he both could get drafted at 115. It's not like some of the names we were talking about early. Chris Paul was 16 on our board. We're going to know within like five to eight spots where he's going to get drafted in like 97% of fantasy leagues. Once we get ADP data to go on top of actual pre-rank data, Chris Paul, by the way, his pre-rank is 26. His ADP is probably going to be between 23 and 32. It's going to be like a 9 to 10 slot window. You know. You know. You can game plan. If you have him at 16, you can wait, and you can take him coming back in the third. Probably really good chance of that. Again, with like Olenek, 
124? He probably goes in a 40-pick window. You just don't know, which is why you got to make an actual list for this point. This is where the buckets are no longer effective. You need binary, and then you need to line them up. Like a real rank board. Your pride rank board should match your draft order board. And it actually is easier at this point because you don't have to think about what everybody else is doing. Just go get your guys at that juncture. Tomorrow, we will finish up our discussion, our early discussion here of the Bespers Buckets. Basically, we'll walk back through most of these names. And then starting on Thursday, we will begin our journey through the Yahoo rank board. And we'll do that one a little bit faster. It won't take like two full weeks. It'll probably be one week. And then I'd like to get into mock season after that. I think we're pretty, I think we're close enough to probably start that in about a week and a half. Holy hot damn. We are like six weeks away from basketball. That's crazy. Anyway, have a great Tuesday, everybody. Welcome back to the normal week. I am Dan Bespers for Fantasy NBA Today. Talk to you tomorrow. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.